In our last lesson, we learned that when you were baptized into Christ, you received the Holy Spirit of God. He, in conformity with his own personal desire, as announced by the prophets of God, promised by Jesus Christ, and confirmed by the apostles of Christ, sent the Holy Spirit into your hearts. As Galatians, the fourth chapter, testifies, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. How God has loved you to give you of his own Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came into your life, he came to confirm that you were God's Son, to give you the confidence and assurance that you had been joined unto the Lord, and to produce in you that divine fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, of love, joy, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith, these heavenly attributes that enable you to live godly in this present evil world. Now in this next installment, we want to consider you being raised and quickened or made alive to God in your baptism. Our texts are taken from two books, the books of Romans and Colossians. First Romans, the sixth chapter and verse four. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And in Colossians, the second chapter, and verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. In the kingdom of God, sensitivity to God is of the highest priority, that you be alert to him, sensitive to him, able to hear him when he speaks to your heart able to discern him when he moves in your behalf, is of critical importance in the things of God. This attribute of sensitivity to God is what made Jacob, the patriarch, and David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, particularly close to God. In Romans, the ninth chapter and verse 13, God confesses, Jacob, have I loved. And in Acts, the thirteenth chapter and verse 22, in reference to David, he is described as the man after God's own heart. Now it was not the moral achievements of these individuals that made them precious to God. Not only had they had success in being morally acceptable to God, but they had had dramatic failures as well. The thing that made them acceptable to God rather than moral attainments or their works or achievements was their sensitivity to God. They were able to recover themselves from setbacks because they were alert, sensitive, and aware of the living God. Such an individual is precious to him. God, you see, has no pleasure in those that draw back and recoil from him. In one of the most profound announcements of Scripture, God indicates to us his extreme displeasure with those that are afraid of him and draw back from him and do not come near to him. In the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 38 and 39, God goes on record. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but of them which believe to the saving of the soul. Now let there be no mistake about this in your thinking. To recoil from God, to be hesitant to come to him, to be insensitive to God, displeases God. He has no pleasure in those that so react to him. But he does greatly delight in those that are alert, sensitive, aware of him, desire him, and find their heart's greatest pleasure in him. Now we are touching on this area of sensitivity in our consideration of you being raised and made alive to God in your baptism. Actually, you were raised from death in trespasses and sins as Colossians 2.13 tells us. You were dead in your sins, that is, you were insensitive to God, unaware of his will for you, and quite unwilling to live for him. You did not receive him as he was, but stood back afar off from him, recoiled from him, and like the Israelites at Sinai, were afraid to come to him. But you have been in your baptism raised from that spiritual death and made alive, sensitive, and receptive to the living God. 
in consideration of death, spiritual death, alienation from God, separation from God, or as it is called, death and trespasses and sins, this death resulted from sin. The Scriptures tell us in Romans the fifth chapter and verse 12 that Adam sinned, and by sin death entered into the world. And death ruled and reigned over the race of man because of sin. Transgression alienated men from God, made them incapable of hearing His voice. It's as though men were moved beyond the perimeter of God's voice. They were not within the circumference of the vision of God's will. They were unaware of Him, unable to please Him, unable to see Him as He really is. Thus distorted views of God's de God developed by those dead in trespasses in sin. Sin slays the person by defiling their conscience, making them more aware of their sin than they are aware of God. Thus their own guilt overshadows the awareness and appreciation of the living God. In Romans, the seventh chapter and verse 11, the Apostle Paul puts language to this concept. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. That is to say, sin made me aware that God was displeased with me, but gave me no ability to discern God would receive me. It deceived me. It made me reconcile myself to be an enemy of God, and thus caused me to be ensnared fully by sin. That's the meaning of spiritual death. Away from God, persuaded that God will not receive you, and alienated from God, unable to understand and perceive His Word, unable to associate the vicarious sacrifice of Christ with you, unable to identify the blessings and promises of God with your own case. You in your baptism were raised, elevated from that state, and made alive to God. In further amplification of this truth of spiritual death, John the Apostle, in his first epistle, 1 John, the fifth chapter and verse 12, says this, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So spiritual death, speaking from a negative viewpoint, is simply not having the life of God. And those who do not have Christ, who have not been baptized into Christ, who have not put on Christ and been made a partakers of Christ, these individuals are without life, in a state of spiritual death. Death, as we have asserted, entered into the world by sin as Romans 5, verses 12 through 14 assert. Thus a wedge was driven between God and man, a gulf formed that the voice of God made it impenetrable to the man's heart. Man contented himself to live at a distance from God. He was alienated from God, actually contrary to God. His thoughts were not God's thoughts. His ways were not God's ways. And as if that were not enough, they competed with God's thoughts and ways. God, as it were, were working in one, was working in one direction and man was working in another. Spiritual death not only separates from God, it thrusts you in the opposite direction of the living God. You become incompatible with God, contrary to God. As Amos the prophet said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You and God, when you were dead in sin, could not walk together because you were not agreed. That's what spiritual death consists of. Jesus, however, by the grace of God, came to remedy this situation. And the remedy was not simply to tell man what he ought to do, to correct, as it were, his habits of life, to bring a new way of life. His way to correct the remedy was to bring life. 